Hey, good morning, First Christian Church. And it was funny because that countdown clock was going and someone said, now we know when we should stop talking. You know, so yeah, so that's kind of fun. All right, so hey, I'm glad you guys are here. I'm glad that we get to worship together. And, and I know some of you are just exhausted because of the weekend that was here, you know. Um, but I'm just glad that everything went well and I'm glad that you got up and I'm glad that you're here. And I'm just glad that we get to fellowship with each other. Uh, for those of you who are at home, um, you, you should see it in here. We've got four people on this side. We've got five people over on this side. And then we've got pews that are full in the back. So uh, it's, it's kind of fun. All right. So hopefully uh, when you walked in, you grabbed the communion in the back if you wanted the pre-made communion. Uh, we still are going to be passing out communion every Sunday or having you go back and get it uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, and, uh, uh, so, and then he also grabbed one of these things. So this is our, our bulletin. So on the back of the bulletin, uh, we've got some announcements. Uh, one of the things that, well, there's a couple of things. One that's not mentioned on here is next Sunday for part of the sermon time, and don't get too excited about this, the Gideons are going to be here. All right, so they're going to be uh, talking about the Gideon program and all the th good things that they do. So that'll be next Sunday. I still will speak for a much shorter length of time. Yay! Right? All right, so I'm still going to hit 2 Samuel next week uh, because that means 1 Samuel is this week. Um, also, uh, there is going to be a church wide church cleanup day. Church wide. So that means. Everywhere, right? Outside, inside, and uh, that's being, uh, there's sign-up sheets in the foyer. You could pick an area that you want to do. It's going to be on the 27th, and we're going to be starting in the morning. Um, and uh, there's even rumors that we're going to have food at lunchtime. So uh, that would be fantastic. So food always brings people in, right? And so if we have a church-wide cleanup day and there's food that's promised, you're going to come and you're going to enjoy and you're going to work hard. All right, so uh, Brad made an article and put it in the, the newsletter for us as well. There is Sunday evening Bible study at 6 tonight. That means that there is choir at 5. And uh, that is all of the announcements that I have. So would you do me a favor? Would you please, um, would you please stand as we have our, our opening prayer? Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for just loving on us and being on, with us. And Father, I know that, uh, I know that as, as we grow closer to you, we grow closer to each other. Because Father, as, as we read through the scriptures and, and as uh, we look at everything, we realize and we know that, that, uh, that our life is not ours. Once we have committed ourselves to you uh, and, and, and shown that we just want to be a part of your family and do everything for you, that at our, our decisions, our wants, and our desires are really not about us. It's about you. And so, Father, when we come on Sunday mornings and, and every single day, it's all about you. It's about your love. It's about your desire. It's about your wants and your wishes. And everything that we do is going to be for you. So, Father, this morning, as we have these songs, as, as, as we sing and as we pray and as we take communion, Father, it is to glorify you. It's not about us. Because we recognize who you are. We recognize that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We recognize that you are the Savior. We recognize that you are the Holy One because you are our God. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Please be seated. Last Sunday afternoon, as I was about to doze off in my recliner and I was thinking back on things that had happened over the weekend, including Sunday morning, I realized I had messed up at the communion meditation because somewhere in there I said we pause during our service to celebrate communion. That's not true. We don't pause to have communion. We pause to have announcements. We pause to sing. We pause for a sermon, as good as it may be, or as long as it may be. But we pause for things. But the celebration of communion is the highlight of our worship service. We celebrate Christmas. We celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And we commemorate Easter, the death, but more important, the resurrection of Jesus, the everlasting life of Jesus Christ, and what it means for us. He rose from the dead for us. No one else has ever done that. No one else ever did. He fulfilled the prophecies. He fulfilled the promises of the Old Testament. He fulfilled his promises. He fulfilled God's promises. So we don't pause for communion. We celebrate communion. And so as we drink of the cup and partake of the bread this morning, let us do so truly in remembrance of him. If you need to go back to the back and get a communion set, please do so. And let's enjoy, let's celebrate communion.
back in the day, there was a series of books titled Left Behind. Do you remember those? Okay. God never leaves anyone behind. If you get left behind, it's your choice. It's not anything God did. God didn't leave us. He doesn't leave us. He will never leave us behind. So, if God's not going to leave us behind, then why do we take Him and put Him behind us sometimes in our daily lives? Why do you put Him behind? Jesus gave His life on the cross. God gave His Son that we wouldn't be left behind. So, conversely... We need to give our lives to God so that we're not leaving God behind. The name of this song is So I Will. It's got a wonderful message. Please sing. God of creation There at the start Before the beginning of With no point of reference You spoke to the dark And fleshed out the wonder of life And as you speak A hundred billion galaxies are born In the vapor of your breath If the stars were made to worship so loud God of your promise Don't speak in vain No syllable empty or void For once you were spoken Only through and silence
We all know the story about the three men in the fiery furnace. There was a fourth person in that fiery furnace. Those guys weren't in there by themselves. God was with there with them. When we go through the trials that we go through through daily life, through those hard times, when you think you're alone, you're not. Because there's another that will go through the fire with you.
So Thursday, I had a, uh, uh, took all the staff, we went out to the pantry on 45, and uh, uh, as we were waiting for our food, and uh, a lady came up to me, and she goes, your daughter Cameron, and I was like, yeah, 
you know, uh, over at Rose's Drug, and, and uh, we were just talking one day, and she mentioned about all the snow that her aunt had, or her grandmother had in northern Illinois. And I'm like, yeah, they had all, all the snow over there. And she was like, yeah. And I, she goes, and I asked, where in northern Illinois does your grandmother and your, your aunt live? And she goes, oh, Mendota. And she said, I know exactly where Mendota is. No, no one knows where Mendota is. All right? And, uh, and she was like, yeah. She goes, my daughter lives in Dixon. I went, I know where Dixon is. And she was like, yeah. And do you know Oglesby? And I'm like, yes, I know Oglesby. And she was naming off all these towns that were like within a half hour, 45 minutes of, of uh, where my mom lives and where my sister lives. And I'm like, yeah, I know all those. And she was like, okay, yeah. And she goes, I'm going to hopefully go up and see her. And I said, that's great. And she left. And I was like, who was that? I have no idea who she was. But it's kind of funny, because only in a small town will things like that happen. And I think more people know her than they know me, and that's all right with me. All right, so uh, you guys hopefully uh, were able to get through and read uh, First Samuel. Did you guys all get through it? I, I like, here, here's one of the reasons why I like Samuel. Not only because of the prophet and because of Eli, but then it gets into Saul, King Saul. And when you get into King Saul, it doesn't take long for the heart of Saul to be revealed. And it didn't take long for him to get impatient with God. And because he got impatient with God, do you remember what he did? He did a sacrifice, right? And he, he's the one that got to, to Eli. He was the one that got to Samuel. And he was like, listen, you, you, you said you were going to be here at a specific time and you weren't. So I went ahead and did that, 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 that sacrifice that only priests are supposed to do. And I did it because I needed the blessing of God. And you were late. You weren't on time. And so I did it myself. And therefore, um, I made the sacrifice because you were late. Sometimes it's so much easier just to blame other people than to take the blame ourselves. You were late, therefore I had to do the sacrifice. And he looked at him and he said, man, you really messed up. You really messed up. Because of this action, because of what you just did, there's a consequence. And that consequence is, you just lost your kingdom. God has already picked out someone else who's going to replace you. And did you notice when we start reading about David, did you notice that even though David knew he was going to eventually become the king of the kingdom, he still had to be under Saul. He still had to be obedient to Saul. Even though Saul was trying to kill him, David still protected him. How many times did David, could have David killed him? Twice, right? And he didn't. He's like, I would never do that to you. And Saul's like, oh, my son, come see me. You are way better than me. And David's like, okay. And then he tries to kill him later on. He's like, what happened to my son? <laughs> but then we get to see the heart of David and what he did. But before all of that happened, turn to 1 Samuel. And we're going to be in chapter 3. Chapter 3, starting in verse 1, it says, The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in the usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying there in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli. And he said, Here I am. You called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. 
Now Samuel did not know that it was the Lord. The word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. The third time the Lord called Samuel, Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told him, Go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Now, here's the thing about that. We can relate to that little boy. And we should relate to that little boy. There are so many times that God is calling you. He's yelling out your name. He's telling you, Cain! 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 There we go, right? That was not planned, by the way. But too many times he is calling your name out loud. Wanting you to do something. And we get confused. We, we go in the wrong direction. We do something wrong. We go to the wrong place. But as you see here, that, that he was going to the person he thought he was supposed to do. He was going to, 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 the, to the high priest. He was going to him and talking to him and sharing with him. But, but the high priest was like, listen, it's not me. You're, he's not calling me. He's not, I'm not the one calling you. He's calling you. But did you notice that there was something different in this? What did he say there? He said, if. Go and lie down and if he calls you. Say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. If. See, here's the thing about this. God could have stopped calling him. I already called you three times. You didn't answer me. You ran off in the wrong direction to the wrong person, and you weren't listening to me. If he calls you. How many times has God called you to do something and you didn't do it and you went to the wrong place or you went to the wrong person and talked to them how many times go speak to that person at the grocery store um, I gotta go to the gas station first go, go talk to your neighbor yeah I, I, I don't like my neighbor go, go, go to this person and talk to them go Go do this. Go, go give that homeless person this some money. Go, go take care of these people. Uh, I, 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 uh, until you finally get that direction that you need. Until that person finally says to you, would you just do what the Lord tells you to do? Just do it. That's where we got to get to the point. We don't have too many chances here on earth. We don't have too many chances to hear the word of the Lord tell us to do something that we can't let it pass by. We've got to do what he tells us to do. If he says to you, go and do this. If you, you say this. If you go this. So what did he do? So some of you went and lay down into place. Verse 10, then the Lord came and stood there calling at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak for your servant is listening. So he actually, actually went back. He said, go back and lay down. If he comes to you and speaks to you, this is exactly what you say. And Samuel lay down exactly where he was supposed to. And he said exactly what he was told to say. Speak for your servant is listening. How is this so hard? How is this so hard in our Christian walk? You know, we, he's given us all of the clues. He's given us everything that we ever need to share with people about who God is. How is it so hard for us to share this great, amazing book to other people around us? He's given you every single word that you need to speak. Everything that you ever need to know is found in this book. But we don't. Oh, that's, he's a little boy, but uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't say those things to God. Why not? I don't say those things to other people that I meet on the streets. Why not? Why not? Someone on the street, in the last, this past week I was in a store, and he goes, hey, you know what? 
I'm really upset with you. And I go, why are you upset with me? He goes, because you allowed all that snow and ice to hit us last week. And I'm like, how am I responsible for this? And they said, well, you know the big guy, so you should have been talking to him. I go, for one thing, I never refer to him as the big guy. All right? He is not the big guy. And, uh, and I said, I, I, I apologize on God's behalf for the snow and the ice. I said, but I had nothing to do with this. We go and talk. We share. No matter who. No matter who. Then he goes on. Verse 11. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. <laughs> That's a pretty big thing there, huh? I'm about to do something in Israel that will make all the ears tingle. Okay. At that time, I will carry out uh, carry out against Eli everything I spoke about his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about his sons blasting God, and he failed to restrain them. Oh. He knew what his sons were doing, and he did nothing about it. He knew what was going on in his kingdom or that he was supposed to rule and he did nothing about it. How many times do we know things about someone and a sin that they're going through and the hardship they're going through and we don't do anything about it? But I, I, I can't go talk to that person about their sin. Why not? Aren't we supposed to be there for each other? Aren't we supposed to be there to help each other? Aren't we supposed to be there to help us through all of those things? But that's not my job. Ah. But then the judgment comes. And we're supposed to do what he wants us to do. Say what he wants us to say. Go where he wants us to go. But I'm going to do it. Look at verse 14. Therefore I swore to the house of Eli, atone for, by, um, uh, excuse me, therefore I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for, for sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until morning and then opened the door for the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision, but Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. And then Samuel answered, here I am. What is it that he said to you? And Eli asked, do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hidden nothing, and he hid nothing from him. Then Eli said, he is the Lord. Let him do what is good in my eyes. Is that what it says? his eyes do to me what is he will do whatever he feels is good in his eyes not mine not mine man because you know what he wants you know what the father would say that's my kid those are my boys I know, that they're, I know that they're taking the fat and good meat out of the sacrifices and they were eating themselves. I, I know that they were doing that, but those are my sons. Those are my boys. Those are, those are, those are my kids. Those are, that's my neighbors. Those are my, those are my friends. Those are, those are my, my co-workers. Those are my, you, those, those are my parents. Those are, those are, my, those are my, the, the people that I love and I'm around every single day. And, the, and that's my congregation. And, and, and those are the people that I worship with. And, and those are the, my co-workers. Those are my friends at school. Those are all those people. And, and I know that they're not supposed to be doing those things, but I can't talk to them. I can't share with them. I can't, I can't do that to them because, because that, those are the people that I love and I love to be around. I could not talk to them about that. So, so I, I can't do that. I can't, I can't let that happen to them because I know that they're doing those sinful, horrible things, but there's nothing I can do about it. And God's like, should have talked to them. You should have told them. 
You should not have let them go through all that. They are taking what's mine. God says they were taking my fat. They were taking my lean, uh, choice cuts of meat. They were doing everything that, they, that I know that, that was supposed to be for me, and they took it for themselves, and that was wrong. But I can't talk to them. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. We have to. Because he's going to discipline them and do what is best for them in his eyes, not ours. That's just the way it is in life. I, Sunday morning is a stressful time for me. I know you look at this calm exterior that I have and not realize... It's a stressful time for me because I've got to make sure that everything works. I've got to make sure that everything is running smoothly. I've got to make sure that, that the TVs work, the monitors over there. I've got to make sure those are plugged in right. I've got to make sure that this is all working correctly. I've got to make sure that the sound system is working correctly. But you know one of the biggest frustrations that I have is this thing right here. This thing right here. I was back there talking to Chris before service. And, uh, and I'm standing and it just keeps moving over and hitting my mouth and I'm like trying to adjust it and I'm, it, and it, I adjust it and it would move over and hit my mouth and he goes, you know, that's just a test. Cause that's exactly what it is. And I'm like, I know, I know it's a test, but it's a, just, just, if, if we could just fix this thing so that it doesn't move and it doesn't and make noises, we're good, but it's just a test. Oh. But I know it's good for me. He goes, he's just teaching you patience. Thank you, Chris. I know. What's he trying to teach you? Because he's going to allow things to happen to you and to your family and to your loved ones and your coworkers and your schoolmates that is best in his eyes, not yours. So why did he allow the cancer to come? Because it's best in his eyes that you have that. Why am, I, why am I almost out of money every single month? Because it's best in his eyes that you are almost out of money every single month. But what about it's best in his eyes that he allows that to happen in your life? Do you understand that? It's not about us. It's not about what we want in our eyes. It's about what he sees that is best for us. So then he goes down. And then he goes on. Verse 19, Then the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he, and, uh, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Be uh, Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear in Shiloh, and there revealed himself to Samuel through his word. And Samuel, chapter 4, And Samuel grew, uh, uh, Samuel's word came to uh, all Israel. Now the Philistines, or excuse me, now the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek. The Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel, and as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 of them at the battle. When the soldiers returned to camp, the uh, elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the, of the Lord's covenant to Shiloh, so that he may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. So the people sent men to Shiloh, and they brought back the ark of the covenant of the Lord Almighty, who was enthroned between the cherubims. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the covenant of the God. Where does God reside? Between the cherubims. On top of the ark, they had the cherubims that were sculpted there. And they had their wings going back. So they were on each side. And their wings went back. And some of the pictures are the depicts that the, the wings touched. And the, in the ark of the covenant was the Ten Commandments, Aaron's throne, and one other thing, the manna. The manna was in there. 
And so with the, the tabernacle, whenever that went anywhere, the ark went with them. And the ark sat there. And God came and sat in between those cherubims. And that is where he was enthroned. You know when I learned that? About 10 years ago. Never saw that in my entire life until someone said to me, hey, ask me the question, do you know where God is enthroned? No idea. Why not? No idea. You better find out. Right there. And he goes on. Verse 5, when the ark of the Lord's covenant came to the camp, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines asked, what is this shouting in the Hebrew camp? When they learned that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. A god has come into the camp, they said. Oh no, nothing like this has ever happened before. We are doomed. Who can deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Don't read anymore. Nothing like this. But the Israelites, once it got there, they shouted for joy. Because God was there in the camp with them. When was the last time you picked up this book and you went, Whoa, I got the Word of God! Oh, it's right here in my presence! It's right here in my hand! I've got the Bible! Yes! Oh, I can't wait to read it! This will be amazing! Oh, the Word of God is here! Nothing like this has ever happened before. I finally got the Bible in my hand and I can't wait to read it. I can't wait to devour it. This is going to be amazing. Do you ever do that? Probably not. Because I know what a lot of us do. Man, I've got to read 2 Samuel next week. Oh, they are so long. It's Old Testament. I don't like the Old Testament. But i got to read 2 Samuel next week. You think that's bad? Wait until you get to Isaiah. Or Job. Oh. But it's right here. And did you notice what the... Philistines knew they brought in the same God that got them out of Egypt. Um, that same God that did those miracles there, that destroyed pretty much our entire nation when they got here, that's the same God they just brought in. What do people know about you? What do they know about what God has done through you that's going to make an impact? What are they going to say? Do they know about your past? Do they know about your history? Do they know about the things that you were stuck in, the sins you were stuck in, and how God changed you and took you out so that when you go and talk to them or they go and share, they can say those things? Man. You don't cuss, Eric? No, I don't cuss. Don't say a cuss word. Never even pops in my mind. Well, when's the last time you said a cuss word? Back in 1991, July, the last time I said a cuss word. Oh, so, so you know how to stop cussing? Yes! C- can you help me with this? Yes! Because I did these things and I took these steps and, man, God, man. And so it's going to get known that the preacher over at First Christian Church hasn't said a cuss word in almost 30 years. 30 years, 30 years this July will be 30 years. Oh. What about you? What has God healed you through? What has God taken you through? How has God performed miracles in you that people can know about so that they can come to you and talk to you and know the power of God is in you? All right, let's go on.
Verse 9, be strong, Philistines. Be men, or you will be subject to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. Verse 10, so the Philistines fought and the Israelites were defeated and every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The ark of the God was captured and Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, Phin died. Gone. Let me tell you. The things that God says he's going to do, he will do. How long did it take for those things to happen? He says, your sons did this, they're going to die. How long? A long time. God will do what he says he's going to do in his time for what he says is good in his eyes, not ours. But you have a story to tell. You have people that you're supposed to talk to. You have people that you're supposed to be a witness to. And if you don't do it, he will make an accounting for it. Get it? Got it? That's what he's supposed to do. All right, our song of invitation that we have this morning is I need thee every hour. So if you need anything, if you need prayer, if you need to come down and and, uh, and talk to me for a moment, please do. Uh, we're going to have our uh, invitation song. It's going to be, I need thee every hour. So we're going to stand and we're going to sing. So would you please do so? Close and pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for just allowing us to, to be a part of your, your family and be a part of this congregation and, and, and letting us come and sing and pray and, and take communion and listen to a message. And, and Father, I just, I just pray that you just continue to watch over us and bless us and, 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 and just be with us as a congregation. But Father, I also pray that you be with us in our hearts, be with us in our spirits, be with us in our minds and strengthen us in every single way so that when we hear the voice of you calling us to go and do something, that we go and we do it to the right people at the right time in your way so that your message can be spread. So, Father, I ask that you please continue to bless us and help us. Continue to show us what we need to do, Father, so that we can bring you glory and not bring it to ourselves. Thank you, Father, for all that you have done. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.